Good morning. Good morning. I'm glad you're all here today. Yesterday was an amazing day. Uh, for those of you who don't know, um, a few days ago, uh, Kenneth uh, fell and he was in the hospital and Jimmy called me and said, we need to do a wheelchair ramp. And I said, I agree with you. And we talked about it a little bit. He said, well, do you think it's going to hurt the cleanup day? And I said, well, it might, but I mean, that's not, we need to get this wheelchair ramp done and we need to get the church cleaned up and it'll all work out. Well, Saturday morning I woke up and I walk across the street and the men are getting ready and they're, they're gathering up and there were 12 to 15 men going to build the wheelchair ramp and I said, oh no, there's not going to be anybody to help with the cleanup day. Well, I apparently need to have a little bit more faith because over 30 people showed up to clean up the building. So we had over 50 people working yesterday, cleaning this place up, loving on a family in the church. And it was just incredibly encouraging to me to see that and to be part of that. So thank you to those of you who helped beforehand and helped mark stuff and clean up. You know who you are. Thank you to those who came and helped carry stuff, to those who have gone to visit Kenneth in the hospital, to those who have built the wheelchair ramp. It is awesome that this church is so willing to go out and serve Christ. And so thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. Today we're going to be looking at Galatians chapter 5. So turn there with me if you would. Why this passage? Well, as you remember, we did a series through the seven churches of Revelation. And we looked at the symptoms of a healthy church and the symptoms of a sick church. Well, obviously, we want the symptoms of a healthy church. But you have to figure out how do you get there. You can't just wish for those things. You actually have to do something about it. And then we looked at Acts chapter 2 and we looked at the early church. And the early church was focused on five key practices. They were focused on scripture reading, fellowship, which is accountability, and uh, encouragement for one another. We looked at worship. We looked at evangelism. We looked at in prayer. We looked at these different practices. But do you see a problem with just saying, well, we're, we're going to do those five things. All right, we're, we're going to do that. We're going to more Bible studies and more of this and more of that. If we say, well, we have to do these five things to build the church. Well, that puts the weight on us. And that puts the focus on us. Certainly we need to be thinking about these things and we need to be making plans. But we can't do this on our own. You don't build a healthy church by going through a checklist. You don't build a healthy church by just instituting five different practices and saying we're going to do these things. See, if, if we can't save ourselves, we rely on Christ and His Holy Spirit to come in and change us. Well, then we rely on Christ to build a church too. We rely on the Holy Spirit to come in and show us how to live. Show us how to grow as a church. Show us how to build our faith. It's not about me. It's about Him. And that's what I want us to see in Galatians chapter 5 and over the next few weeks. We need to learn to follow the Holy Spirit where He leads us. Because a, a Bible study program at this church down the road might not look like what our Bible study program looks like. And, and uh, incorporating prayer meetings at that church won't look like it looks here. And there's no list in the Bible for where, you, well, you should have a Monday morning and a, and a Friday night prayer meeting. That's not in here. So how do we figure out what God specifically is calling us to do? What we're going to do is we're going to look at this passage and we're going to see that we need to learn to follow the Holy Spirit. As a church, we have to learn to follow the Holy Spirit. But if we want to follow the church as a Holy Spirit, each and every, follow the Holy Spirit as a church, sorry, each and every one of us needs to surrender our day to day to the Holy Spirit's leading. Each and every one of us needs to surrender our every decision, our every waking moment to, Father, what do you have for me today? What's your plan for my life today? And then we'll watch as God comes in and just continues to build this church and grow it and draw us all closer to Him. I, I labeled today something along the lines of keep in step with the Spirit. What does that mean? When I think of the Christian life, and this is an example, I'll say the same thing C.S. Lewis said. If I give you an example and it confuses you, it doesn't help you, forget the example. I'm not trying to, if it confuses you, come and talk to me afterwards. I've probably got a, a few more examples we can go through. I think of the Christian life as a train. And a train runs on two tracks. What happens if you take away one track? Well, you got a problem. You're going to have a wild ride. Well, what are the two tracks in the Christian life? Well, on the one side, you've got truth. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean God's Word. 
There are things that we as a Christian are called to do by Christ. They're non-negotiables. We are called to study Scripture. We are called to pray. There are certain things we're called not to do. We're called not to steal, not to commit adultery, not to murder. These are the do's and don'ts of our relationship with Christ. They don't make me, they don't make Him love me. He already loves me. They're proof that I have a relationship with Him. So that's the truth. Over here on the other side, we have grace. Well, what is grace? Grace is the understanding that I'm a sinner. When Jesus Christ hung on that cross, He knew I was a sinner. He sees my whole life laid out in front of Him. He sees my birth, He sees my death, and He sees every sin in between. He knows I'm not perfect. That's why He had to die on the cross. There's forgiveness when we make mistakes. But notice, you have to ride on both rails. Your train can't ride on either one. If I get so hung up on truth to the exclusion of grace, I become a legalist. Well, what's wrong with legalism? Well, first of all, we're teaching the world that it's about my efforts. I do, 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 and then God loves me. Secondly, what happens when you make a mistake? What happens when you sin, which we will? Your train derails. Shipwrecks your faith, as Paul would say. And then on the other side, what happens if I hang too close to the grace rail? Well, then I become, what's, I become licentious. Licentiousness. License to sin. Oh, well, Jesus died on the cross for me. I can do whatever I want. I can steal this. Jesus will still love me. Does that person really have a relationship with Christ? No. So we have to learn to say, Father, I'm going to give you each and every day of my life. When I make mistakes, Father, I know you'll forgive me, but I am doing my best. And if we follow on those rails, well, where does it lead us? Wherever the track goes. Does the train lay the track? No. God lays the track. The Holy Spirit lays the track. He has a plan for your life this morning. Each and every day when I wake up, it's not, what do I want to do today? Which, a lot of times, that is the first thought that goes through my head. It's, Father, what do you have for me to do today? And we'll talk more about that in a minute. What we need to see is that each decision you make, you have a choice to serve God or not. If we are serving ourselves, we are not serving God. It's exclusive. You're serving God or you're not. And if we are serving Christ... Our life will show it. If we are following the Holy Spirit, our life will be a witness to the world around us. Our church will be a witness to the world around us. I'm going to read Galatians chapter 5. We'll read 16 through 26, and then we'll pray. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. <coughs> But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Let me pray for us. Father, I ask you to move in this place this morning. Holy Spirit, guide us in this discussion. Guide us in the study of the Bible. That you would show us where we are running on our own track. Where we have derailed our train. Lord, that you would show us where you would have us go as a church and as individuals. That every decision we make would not be based on my preferences, my desires, my wants, but that it would be based on your plan for our lives. 
Father, we praise you for this church. We praise you for this community. And we pray that we would shine brightly for you wherever you take us. Break hearts, open minds this morning, that lives might be changed for an eternity. In your name we pray. Amen. But I say... He's contradicting something. See, some Judaizers, that's what Paul refers to them as, had come into the church in Galatia. And they'd come in and they'd say, wait a minute, you're not circumcising your children? You're not obeying all the Sabbath laws of the Old Testament? You're not keeping all of the rituals? You're not doing the sacrifices? What are you thinking? God's not going to love you if you don't follow the law. They had turned it all onto that one rail, that legalism rail. You have to do, do, do. And then on the other hand, there were people who were saying, no, we don't have to do anything. Jesus loves us regardless. And there was this fight between these two camps. And Paul is writing to them and saying, actually, you're both off. It's in the middle we follow God. We follow His law. Understanding that we are sinful and going to make mistakes. And it's in this way I learn to follow where God is leading me each and every day. I'm not distraught and destroyed when I sin because I know I'm a sinner. He says, stop trying to earn God's love on either side and learn to just trust Him. And if you will obey Him each and every day, if you will surrender your each and every moment, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Verse 17, For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want. They're diametrically opposed. Every decision I make, I have the decision to worship God or to not. Well, if I'm not worshiping God, then who am I worshiping? I'm worshiping myself. Each and every day I have the decision to be generous, to be loving, to be kind, or I can choose to do what my flesh wants to do. You all have seen in the cartoons before, it's a silly example, but the angel and the demon on both shoulders, right? You've seen that before. And that is not literally, right? I don't, I'm not seeing angels and demons on my shoulders. Don't commit me or anything. But we have that decision. Am I going to do what God has called me to do today? Or am I going to do what I've called myself to do my son just turned three years old. Most of you have seen Connor. Uh, if, if, if you haven't seen him, I know you've heard him. Anyway, he is not always the best listener. It's because he talks nonstop. Anyway, he's not always the best. And you go, what, a three-year-old and he doesn't listen well? What's wrong? Actually, sometimes he listens too well. The GLA program the other night, he wanted to sing. And I said, you can't go on stage till after I talk. I finish talking. I'm walking off these steps. And he runs and jumps on those steps. But anyway, sometimes verbal cues don't work well with him. And sometimes it's not appropriate to just jump to punishment because he hasn't figured out what he's doing wrong all the time. Sometimes he knows what he's doing wrong and he looks at you before he does it. So my wife came up with a system and she's used this with kids in therapy before. She has a stoplight and there's a red face, it's got a frowny face on it. There's a yellow face, it's kind of a puzzled expression. And then there's a green one and the green one's got a smiley face and there's a little clothespin with his name on it and his picture. And when he's doing well, 90% of the time, that might be a little generous, uh, the majority of the time, his clothespin is on the green. He's listening to us. He's not hurting his sister. He's doing what he's supposed to be doing. When he starts to act up, all my wife has to do is look at him and say, you're getting ready to go to yellow. And it's some kind of mom voodoo. I don't know how that works, but it works. Most of the time. But every once in a while he'll keep acting up. So she moves him to yellow and he cries and she'll lean down or kneel down. She'll get in his face and go, Connor, you have a decision right now. You can do what you're supposed to do, whatever that may be. Listen to your dad, listen to your mom. You can obey us here and you'll go back to green and nothing bad will happen. Or you can keep doing, fill in the blank, whatever it is, and I'm going to move your clothespin, and you're going to be in red. And if I move you to red, you're going to lose this toy and this toy, and you're going to go to time out, whatever punishment she comes up with. And it's amazing. It's like a, my son does a complete 180. He goes, oh, 
Uh, he doesn't want to go to red. He doesn't want to lose that toy. I don't think I've, we've never moved him to red. We've been doing this for like two weeks. Haven't had to move him to red a single time. It's like he understands there's repercussions coming. There's punishment coming. How many times do I as a Christian understand that the choice in front of me, if I go this way, if I listen to that demon on my shoulder, there's going to be punishment. There's going to be repercussions. And I go, ah, it doesn't matter. I'm going to do it anyway. Or I refuse to listen. And you know... The Holy Spirit, it's not an angel, it's the Holy Spirit in my heart saying, Aaron, there's punishment there. There's repercussions. That way leads to death. Don't go that way. Go this way. This is the way I've built you to go. Flip over a couple pages to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, we're only going to read three verses. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. And Ephesians is the next book, so if you went further than that, you went too far. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Jesus Christ has saved us. He's given us the Holy Spirit. Verse 10. For we are His workmanship. In Greek, this is poema. It's the word we get poem from. Uh, some translations, yours might say masterpiece. We are Christ's work of art created in Christ Jesus for good works. Listen to this next part. Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Go back to Galatians. I was made and my life was mapped out so that every day there was a way I could serve Christ. Jesus Christ has put people in my path every day that I can share the gospel with, that I can love on. He's given me things that I can do that serve Him. And it's whether or not I'm actually looking that makes the difference. Christ says, every day you can serve me. I've put these good works in your path. Now are you going to follow me where I lead? Or are you going to run your own show? I can't tell you how many times as a pastor I've had a plan for my day. And then that completely goes out the window. Somebody ends up in the hospital. Somebody's got some sort of crisis and they need counseling. Or, or Robert Travis needs something. I don't know. <laughs> but, but something changes. And I remember, and I might have shared this story before. Forgive me if I have. I remember one of my first few months in ministry, I called my pastor and I said, how do you get anything done with the constant interruptions? And he stopped me and he said, your mindset's all wrong. The interruptions are the ministry. That's where we get to love people. Jesus Christ has, the Holy Spirit has brought that person to me that I might love on them. Am I going to take the opportunity? Am I going to say, no, that's not my plan for today. I'm going this way. That's when my train derails. They are opposed to each other. You serve Christ or you serve yourself. It's one or the other. Verse 19, but if you are led by the Spirit... What does it mean to be led? It means He's showing you a path. The problem with leading, though, is that, you know, I tell my son, follow me. <laughs> that doesn't work well. I have to stand behind him and push him where he's supposed to go. But when you tell someone to follow you, they have a choice, yes or no. They have a choice whether they are going to listen. If you will follow the Holy Spirit, if you are led by the Spirit... You are not under the law. Why is that important? These people were taking the Galatians back to do, 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 which was a misinterpretation of the Old Testament anyway. But they were trying to take them back to that. And Paul says, no, 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 you're not under that anymore. See, here's the problem with the law. Under the law, the first time I sin, I'm guilty. What am I deserving of the first time I sin? Death. I'm deserving of hell. The Bible says that each and every person was born under the law of sin and death. What's the law of sin and death? You will sin and you will die. It's fairly straightforward. But when Christ died on the cross, He opened a way for me to follow Him in salvation. When I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior... Well, let's turn to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. Keep your finger in Galatians. 
In Romans chapter 7, Paul is writing, and, and Romans is his magnus opus, his masterpiece, because he's writing to a church he never got to visit. So he lays out every little theological detail he can possibly think of. Romans chapter 7, Or do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. It makes sense, right? If somebody's guilty of murder, but then they die, well, I can't put them on trial. This is, well, I guess I could, like weekend at Bernie's kind of thing. <laughs> I mean, you prop them up in the corner. You can't punish them. You can't do anything to them. Satan is sitting there watching me going, uh-huh, God, God, he sinned. Throw him in hell. He deserves death. Let's keep reading. Verse 4. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. I was a slave to sin. Every decision I made was med led by my flesh. It was met led by my sinful desires. When I accepted Christ... Baptism is a symbol of dying to your old self, being raised to walk in newness of life. I literally died. My sinful flesh died in that moment. I am no longer bound to sin. I have a decision to make whether I will serve or whether I will rebel. Does it mean that now that you're saved there's no sinful temptations? No, that's ridiculous. Those of you who have accepted Christ know the temptation's still there. But now there's a choice. You are not bound to sin. You are free from under the law. Verse 19, Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality. That's taken thousands of forms throughout the world. I can sit here and list off a bunch of stuff, but there's no point. You know what sexual immorality is. Any sexual relationship outside of marriage, whether it be while you're married, before you're married, after your, well, I mean, after your spouse passes away, if it's still outside of marriage, anything involving my body in a sexual way, and impurity and sensuality are tied to that. Idolatry, what do you worship? What's the most important thing in your life this morning? Sorcery, enmity, strife. I don't need to sit here and read all these out. How many of you are guilty of one of these? Don't raise your hand. We're all guilty of some of this. So when he lists off all of these things, is he saying, because he ends with, I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Is he saying that if you ever get angry, that you can't be a Christian? Is he saying that if you ever fail in sexual immorality in some way, that you can't be saved? If you ever worship money instead of God, that you can't be saved? No. Go back and reread it. It says the works of the flesh are evident. And then it says those who do such things. It has the application of those who are led by these things. Go back and look at this list. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality. The problem with engaging in these sins is that I can't engage in these and be led by the Holy Spirit. The moment I choose to engage in sexual immorality, the moment I choose to engage in jealousy or anger or envy or drunkenness, I'm no longer following God's plan for my life. I've derailed on that licentious trail. I'm doing whatever I want to do and the track's over there and I'm going this way. Ephesians chapter 5 says, Do not get drunk off wine which leads to debauchery. But be filled with the Holy Spirit. But be filled. Meaning be led. I'm not letting my flesh call the shots. I will make mistakes. I will fail. But in my day-to-day -day life, I am choosing Christ over fill in the blank. Whatever sin is there. He says, instead of being led by your flesh, verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is... Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Don't answer this out loud. Verse 22, look at it carefully. How many fruits are there? Think about it for a second. Go back and reread it carefully. It's not the answer you're thinking. Read it again. But the fruit of the Spirit. How many fruits are there? There's one. There's one fruit. 
One fruit with nine characteristics. But the fruit, it's singular. I remember as a young man saying, well, patience isn't my thing. I guess I don't have that fruit. Or uh, kindness, that isn't my thing, so I guess I just don't have that fruit. If you read it carefully, but the fruit of the Spirit... Each and every one of us has opportunities to display these things. Just as we have opportunity to engage in dissensions or divisions or sexual immorality, this list over here, in that same moment I have the opportunity to be loving or joyful or peaceful or patient, kind, good, faithful, gentle, or self-controlled. God will not allow us to be tempted beyond what, we were, but beyond what we are able, but in all things will provide a way of escape. When I have this opportunity for anger sitting in front of me, God's sitting there going, that's not the way the track's leading, Aaron. Here's how you can be kind to that person instead of lashing out in anger. The fruits of the Spirit are the response to these sins over here. If I'm truly following Christ, I am going to be loving and joyful and peaceful. Doesn't mean I'm not going to have a day where I'm upset. It doesn't mean there's going to be a day where I'm not gentle. I snap at my kid or something. It means that in the day to day I am choosing these things over the sinful things on the other side. It means that when the opportunity arises, I'm saying, well, Satan wants me to go this way, but God's calling me to do this. I'm saying, Father, where's the track lead here? Sometimes these decisions are hard. Sometimes they're obvious. Sometimes they're right in front of you. I know when I'm sinfully angry at someone. That's obvious to me. But sometimes there's sins buried deep in my heart and I have to go to God and say, Father, something's going on in my heart and I don't know what it is. Where am I messing up here? What is your plan for today? Verse 24. And those who belong to Christ... Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. What are you led by today? What's the guiding force each and every day? Are you responding out of a need or a want for more money? Are you responding out of a want for sexual satisfaction that you think you deserve? Are you responding out of some sort of need to be loved by everyone? which Jesus told us specifically Christians would not have? Or are you responding in the desire to follow Christ and where the Holy Spirit is leading you? We have to give up the old to take on the new. Ephesians chapter 5, it says we take off the sinful flesh, the sinful, and then what do we put on? The armor. We take off the old life, we put on the new life. If you have done that, if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you now have the opportunity to follow Him wherever He leads you. If you will choose to follow. Verse 25, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. So what does that mean when I take the wrong step? What does that mean when I fall off the track? Because it will happen from time to time. Bill Bright, founder of Campus Crusade, in the 50s uh, came up with the term spiritual breathing. And it's been used by a whole bunch of different people. It was probably in some form before that, but I worked with Campus Crusade, so that's where I heard it. So that's what I'm attributing it to. He said that when we sin, one of the most important things we can do is repent. To spiritually exhale. To let go of it and say, God, this is yours. I messed up. Man, I messed up bad. No matter how bad you may think it is, God is calling us to repent. Like my son on yellow has to choose, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm going to follow God. You find yourself in the midst of that sin. You find or immediately after the sin. And you go, Father, this is yours. I'm sorry. But to truly repent means to walk away, to go in an opposite direction. And as we spiritually exhale that for God, to God, we inhale and we say, Father, I know that you've forgiven me. Help me follow you today. We exhale, we repent to God, and then we inhale, we go back to God and say, now what would you have for me? Where would you lead me? Where would you guide me? 
Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. If we, if we are all on this track together, will there ever be a collision? No. If we are on the track, the track runs in one direction. As a church, we are running in one direction. If we are all going in the same direction, there's never going to be a collision. That's why when an issue arises like with this, Paul goes, wait a minute. Somebody's focused on the wrong thing. Somebody's got off on a wrong rail. If we're all going in the same direction, this conceitedness, this anger, this envying, that goes away. Who's gotten off track? Each and every day of our lives when we wake up, the decision is in front of us. We can choose to follow, or we can choose to make that day our own and sin. That choice is up to you. As Travis comes forward and leads us in a song, I'm going to be at the front. Maybe you need someone to talk to. Maybe your life's gotten off track. You feel like you're derailed. Maybe you've never given your life to Christ, or maybe you're not sure. I'd love to talk to you. I'll stick around as long as I need to. Maybe you want to join the church. Maybe you're interested in baptism. Come and talk to me. I'd love to pray with your family. I'd love to meet you. Now is the time. Let's not let pride, conceit, don't let any of that get in the way. Come and kneel at the altar if you need to. You can come and pray with Rob. He's here. Travis will be singing, so that would be awkward. But you can come and talk to me. There's deacons around. Find somebody. Don't leave here today without asking the Holy Spirit to direct your life. Travis? Our hymn is 413, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. If you'll stand with me and sing. Oh, so are you weary and dry. just say once again, thank you for being here to worship today. I'm so excited that we're here, family, once again to worship and serve the Lord. Uh, today is an exciting time in the church's life. The Carters came and met with me. Y'all can come on up here. You can fill that card out later. <laughs> uh, Ronnie, Michelle, Allison, and Megan came forward, and they are interested in joining the church. And so I believe what I'm going to do right now is call the church into conference, and I'm going to make a motion that they uh, join our church. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, 
Uh, maybe you're interested in joining the church and you aren't sure what it looks like. This is it. It's relatively painless. Uh, <laughs> right? That was okay, wasn't it? Okay, that's right. Uh, I'm going to pray for us, and then what I'd like for you to do is come and just welcome them. Come and love on them and thank them for covenanting to, to serve with us and to uh, serve alongside. We're excited they're here, and we're thankful for each and every one of them. Father, we thank you for today. Lord, we thank you for this family. We thank you for the opportunity to worship together. Father, we praise you that we can serve you with each and every decision of our lives. Lord, I praise you that you've given us the Holy Spirit to show us where to go. Lord, I pray that we would be sensitive and listen. That each and every day we would say, Father, what's your plan? Where is your track taking me today? Lord, we love you and we thank you for today. In your name we pray. Amen.